I've been doing intermittent fasting for 10 years in different ways. It's been one of the best decisions I've made for my own health, in my opinion. However, over the past two years or so, many experts and doctors who previously supported intermittent fasting are now against it. Today, I just don't feel that that trade-off is worthwhile at least at that extreme level. Was I wrong about intermittent fasting myself? And have I changed my mind about it? In this video, I'm going to outline the most common criticisms of intermittent fasting, and I'll share what are the things I've changed my mind about it. So make sure to click the like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. First off, the biggest reason why there's been a downtrend in intermittent fasting is the idea that it's going to make you lose muscle and it's a net negative for health. If a person is intermittently fasting, you're gonna see a lot of muscle loss unless they're very thoughtful about their protein intake. That's a valid concern, especially for the elderly people who struggle maintaining and building muscle. The claim that fasting is going to make you lose muscle comes from the idea that to build muscle, you need to spread your protein intake across several meals, ideally up to four meals a day. Eating too much protein in one or two meals, like with intermittent fasting, would result in suboptimal results. Indeed, it's been historically thought that you can only absorb 30 grams of protein in one meal. Everything else would be a waste, and that's why you need to spread spread out your protein intake. However, a new 2023 study found that a very large protein intake of 100 grams after exercise results in a larger and longer anabolic response than a low protein intake of 25 grams. Myofibrillar protein synthesis in the 100 gram protein group was about 30% higher than the 25 gram group over the 12 hour testing period. Now, this study doesn't disprove the idea that there's a threshold for maximal protein synthesis. It might actually support that idea because the 100 gram protein group absorbed their protein over a longer period of time. So they were just constantly stimulating the maximal protein synthesis within that time frame. However, what this study does prove is that you can absorb more protein in one meal. While it may not be optimal from a maximum muscle growth perspective, it still shows that you're not wasting your protein if you eat more than 30 grams in one sitting. And it still means that you can effectively build muscle by eating more and eating less frequently. This study also supports my own experience with intermittent fasting. Over the last six years, I've had only two protein meals per day. First, 30 grams of protein before working out and then over 100 grams after the workout. I went from 65 kilograms to 85 kilograms while making continuous progress. But what do the actual human studies say about intermittent fasting and muscle growth? A 2021 systematic review on 23 randomized and non-randomized controlled studies found that time-restricted eating can reduce body mass and improve nutrient metabolism in both normal and overweight individuals. But it doesn't alter protein synthesis and muscle mass, nor does it hamper aerobic fitness and muscular performance among physically active individuals, including athletes. Another 2024 systematic review on the effects of intermittent fasting on sports performance concluded that intermittent fasting improves body composition without hampering physical performance, lean tissue maintenance, or maximum power. The key variable here appears to be sufficient protein intake and doing some form of exercise, especially resistance training. A 2022 study compared the effects of continuous calorie restriction at 20% deficit combined with resistance training and 5-2 inner fasting, where you eat 70% deficit for two days of the week and normal calories at other days, also combined with resistance training for 12 weeks. They saw no significant differences in body composition, muscle quality, and strength between the two groups. That's because both groups did resistance training and both groups ate over 1.4 grams per kilogram per day of protein, which is over 0.7 grams per pound per day. So if you're getting enough protein and you're doing some form of resistance training, then a smaller eating frequency or being in a severe calorie deficit on some days doesn't appear to have any significant effects on muscle loss compared to traditional calorie restriction. Probably eating once a day isn't the most optimal way to maintain and build muscle. You could theoretically do it, but you would need at least two to three meals per day to see significant results. One thing I do have to agree with the experts is that extended fasting has much worse effects on muscle composition and muscle loss. There's no real evidence about the longevity benefits or health benefits of extended fasting that you wouldn't get from otherwise a healthy lifestyle. But there is the risk of potentially losing more muscle the more often you do these kinds of extended fasts that last for three to five days. That's why I'm not doing extended fasts anymore. I might do them like once or twice a year if I'm traveling, but I'm not deliberately like scheduling them into my routine. But I am still doing daily intermittent fasting where I have my 30 grams of protein before my workout and over 100 grams after the workout because it works for me. The second idea is that intermittent fasting doesn't provide any additional 
additional longevity benefits that you wouldn't get from regular calorie restriction. Calorie restriction without malnutrition is one of the few shown non-genetic methods of extending lifespan in all species studied, such as yeast, flies, worms, rodents, and monkeys. In humans, calorie restriction improves markers of health and promotes weight loss. There is some evidence that intermittent fasting has similar longevity benefits as calorie restriction in animals. But those studies are usually done on calorie restricted animals. And the calorie restricted animals also do some form of intermittent fasting. When you don't control for calories, you can get lifespan extension from those studies, but they're always calorically restricted. When you do control for calories, in other words, when you make sure that the mice that are intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding are eating the same number of calories, there's little to no effect on lifespan. It's tiny to zero, depending on the study you look at. So again, I think that supports the idea that total calories is really what's most important, at least in mice, not when you eat those calories or how often you eat those calories. As pointed out by Matt Caberlain and colleagues in their 2021 review, most studies on intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding in animals are done together with calorie restriction. And a lot of the calorie restriction experiments are done together with a component of time-restricted feeding. That is, I think, um, interesting there though, is that uh, if you, in, in mice, if you decouple the circadian component of when they eat, on caloric restriction, you do lose some of the benefits. So, so it's almost as if caloric restriction is necessary for the lifespan extension, but it's not sufficient. You also need this circadian component of when you eat. Another way to say it is, if you want, if you're a mouse and you want to get the benefit from caloric restriction, you have first of all have to be the right genotype. You have to eat less calories, but it is important on when you eat those less calories. If you're a mouse and you're not calorically restricted, it doesn't seem to matter when you eat those calories. So in animals, there appears to be some benefits of having your food in a smaller eating window or at least in alignment with the circadian rhythms. A 2022 study saw that 30% of calorie restriction was enough to extend the lifespan of male mice by 10%. However, a daily fasting window combined with 30% calorie restriction and circadian rhythm alignment extended the lifespan in these mice by 35%, independent of body weight. Fasting with 30% calorie restriction and mis the line circadian rhythms resulted in a 20% longer life. But what about humans? Human research about intermittent fasting has found that it can improve markers of metabolic health, such as blood sugar, triglycerides, waist circumference, and cholesterol in obese as well as non-obese individuals. A 2020 review found that some randomized controlled trials have shown that intermittent fasting offers metabolic benefits and improves glycemic control in people with diabetes. But are those benefits derived from being in a calorie deficit? A 2023 meta-analysis of seven randomized controlled trials found that those following time-restricted eating saw greater reductions in body weight, fat mass, and waist circumference compared to just calorie restriction. However, these time-restricted eating studies weren't controlling for calories. People doing intermittent fasting ended up eating fewer calories, which resulted in greater benefits. So how does intermittent fasting compare to regular calorie restriction? Multiple randomized clinical trials from 2022 and 2023 have shown that when calories are equated, time-restricted eating is effective for weight loss, but not superior to regular calorie restriction, which without restricting the eating window. So it doesn't appear that confining your eating into a smaller window would be superior to regular calorie restriction as long as the calorie intake is the same. But many people just find confining their eating window and doing intermittent fasting a much more effective way to induce a calorie deficit, which I think is a net positive. Fortunately, I've never believed that intermittent fasting is like a magical weight loss tool, but I have changed my mind about the timing of when you should eat. There is evidence from human trials that eating most of your food during the daytime as opposed to at night is healthy even without causing weight loss. So eating earlier is generally healthier than eating later. But your total calorie intake also matters a lot in determining this. It doesn't matter if you overeat in the morning, in the lunchtime, or at evening, they're all bad options. So does it mean that you should be eating breakfast and skipping dinner? Skipping breakfast is often seen to be associated with a high risk of developing type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and all-cause mortality in observational studies. However, breakfast skippers tend to have poorer lifestyle habits. They're more likely to be smokers, be less physically active, and have worse healthy eating scores. A 2019 meta-analysis of prospective studies 
found that skipping breakfast was associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes, but this association was mediated primarily by BMI. Metabolic Mort studies show that skipping breakfast also reduces the amount of physical activity people do. Skipping breakfast without eating late or overeating calories isn't linked to weight gain and poor metabolic health, as long as you don't overeat calories later in the day. But from the perspective of circadian biology, it is better to have your calories earlier in the day than later. This doesn't mean that you have to stop eating at 2 p.m. like some people do. You can still have a regular dinner, just stop eating about 4 to 5 hours before bed. That's going to give you plenty of time to digest the food and also lower your blood sugar levels. Melatonin, the sleep hormone, causes some mild insulin resistance and reduces your glucose tolerance, which is why you don't want to be eating large amounts of carbohydrates immediately before bed. Another point is that you need to fast for 3 to 5 days anyway to activate autophagy, which is this process of cell cleaning. So there's no reason to do daily innovative fasting. That's not really the case. While there are many other things that increase autophagy, such as calorie restriction and exercise, you don't need to fast 3 days to activate it. In fact, there are studies finding that even 16 hours is enough to see an elevation in autophagy genes. Now, we don't fully understand the role of autophagy in longevity. We don't even know how to measure it directly and interpret it. It's certainly a very important process of clearing out the waste material inside cells, but it's very difficult to measure and even if we are able to measure it, we don't know how much is enough or how much autophagy you would need. Because sometimes autophagy is also found to be involved in some malignancies and other diseases, so you don't want autophagy all the time. So I wouldn't inherently worry about trying to maximize autophagy. Just follow the healthy lifestyle habits and make sure you practice some aspects of calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, and maybe consuming teas and coffees that promote autophagy. So what should we make of all of this? Is intermittent fasting debunked and worthless? Here's how I do intermittent fasting based on the newest research. Number one, I have two protein meals per day. One is 30 grams of protein before my workout and then over 100 grams after the workout. That's just my personal preference. It doesn't matter that much how many meals you have as long as you get adequate amounts of protein, which for most people would be at least 1.6 grams per kilogram per day or 0.8 grams per pound per day. Having four meals is probably superior for muscle growth than two meals but the differences are very small for most people. What's more important is the training stimulus. Are you training properly and are you seeing progressive overload? The meal timing is micromanagement. Number two, I stop eating five hours before bed. This is generally better from a sleep quality and circadian biology perspective. However, you do have to experiment with this yourself because some people can't fall asleep without having a snack. If that's you, then I recommend and having a lower glycemic higher protein snack for better blood sugar regulation such as cottage cheese and number three i skip breakfast and have coffee instead as long as you're not overeating calories and are physically active then you don't need to have breakfast however if you like it then go ahead just know that the link between breakfast skipping and higher mortality is mediated by unhealthy lifestyle habits that you can easily avoid overall i haven't changed my mind about intermittent fasting that much over the last five years i have made some adjustments to my routine but i'm still practicing pretty much the same routine i have done for the last five to six years. There's actually been studies that support my personal experience, such as the 100 gram protein study. And scientists have now recognized autophagy being a major hallmark of aging, which it wasn't back in 2019. Intermittent fasting isn't magic and it doesn't make up for other unhealthy lifestyle habits. However, it can certainly be an effective tool for many people to manage their calorie intake and manage their body composition. So you don't have to be afraid of it as long as you're getting enough protein, as long as you're exercising and as long as you're lifting weights. If you want to learn how to build muscle and what's the most optimal way to do so in terms of training and nutrition, then check out my video about my evidence-based muscle growth routine. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. Thanks for watching. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.